This is something probably a bit different and certainly some light relief. Um, this is a story about a side project, a passion project um, that had no real purpose apart from fun and a love of maps and has no commercial objective or business model or anything, which anyone who knows me will know is not normal for me. Um, and here you can hey, see- Stephen, I've, I've sold it. I've sold the domain this afternoon, by the way. Okay, okay, yep. great. I hope you got more than a thousand pounds for it. I did all right. Okay. Carry so on. This is Ken and me um, with a massive elephant skull. And down in the corner, you can see the Mapri logo, which is also an elephant. And um, you might be wondering why. Well, the elephant is a very mappy animal, and it's not because it's representing Postgres SQL. It's because of its ears. And it turns out that the African elephant has an ear which looks like the shape of the map of Africa, the left-hand ear, obviously, as we're looking at it. If you found an Indian elephant, you'd find that its ears are much longer and thinner and closely represent the shape of the map of India. And that sort of triggered Ken and I when we were away together, thinking about elephant's ears to start thinking about maps. And what follows is the story of how we got into creating mappery and maps in the wild. So before I move on, um, I need to give a shout out to my friend Arnaud Ferrand, who is the co-editor of Mappery with me now because Ken is so busy doing elegant cartography at Esri that he hasn't got time to do much more than find loads of maps in the wild and send them to us. How did we start? We were on safari. We were on our way to Dar es Salaam for a conference and we'd just come out the Serengeti National Park and we entered something which is called the Ngorogoro Wilderness. And you can see the wilderness there. And you can see this sort of stone obelisk thing with a map of the wilderness. Um, and Ken walks up to this map and he says, that map was made with ArcGIS X point Y. I don't know what version of ArcGIS. But Ken looked at the fonts on the map, and from those, he knew which version of ArcGIS it was made with, which to me was pretty deep geek, and it was worthy of a picture. And it also became the very first map in the wild. It gave us the idea of a map in the wild. You know, if this isn't wild, I don't know what is. And that is what started the whole idea of maps in the wild. And what, so the first question you're gonna be asking yourself is what on earth is this guy talking about? What are these maps in the wild? Well, a map in the wild can be anything. It can be, well, Ken, what could it be? Um, literally, literally anything, as long as it, as long as it, you know, it's not contrived, you know, it's not on a computer screen that's on your desk or, you know, it's not a map that you've made that you happen to walk somewhere with and show it. It's just a map that exists. Perhaps it's, perhaps it's on traditional signage. Um, you know, maps that you see around town, but perhaps it's just somebody's used a map in an interesting way for marketing, for advertising, for putting empty beer bottles on a wall, for instance, to make a, an art installation. Um, it's kind of, it, it's always, it's always bothered me. You know, whenever you sort of walk into a store and you see things, you know, let's say, round objects uh, I don't know Christmas decorations for instance um, and you, you look through 200 Christmas decorations and you think to yourself well where's the bloody globe why isn't there a globe you know if, to, to me it would be the most obvious thing to put on a you know a, a round three-dimensional object it's you know you, you put a, a map on it um, but a map in the wild then is something that where somebody has done that and whether it's 
the cover of a book or a dress or an art installation or or as we found you know that that i mean it was fantastic you know we're, we're going on a dirt track for five hours and literally the first thing we see is this map that's it if someone decided to put a map in the middle of nowhere and uh that was fan- fantastic yeah it was a great moment so um it could also be something really quirky like this um I don't know, it's a sort of a pool table in the shape of the Americas. Um, no one's ever explained how you'd get the balls from North America to South America. Um, and vulgar suggestions should be sent on a postcard, please. Um, it could be a very tasteless shirt. I've got that shirt. What do you want about? Oh, all right. Uh, it could be a very tasteful shirt. <laughs> and it could be something a bit funny, like... <coughs> wall that's been hacked away to show a rough Mercator map. Um, it could be them. Well, it could be food related. Um, <laughs> of course. You know, a lot, a lot of things make us laugh. I mean, there was this fantastic um, map of New Zealand um, with, you know, the phrase Aussie pies. That made me laugh. I mean, why, why would you use a map of New Zealand to advertise australian pies um you know i mean i I'm, i made a map that's that middle one's mine i made a a wooden cheese board in the shape of um the uk and decided to use it to present geographically located lumps of cheese that come from all different parts of the uk which was which was a tasty map in the wild and then um, there's our friend mark on the right um i happen to accidentally find myself in a brewery with him um, <laughs> a few years ago as happens as happens um in ohio and um we're walking around the brewery exhibit and what what do you see you know normally you, you sort of go to the seaside and you put your head through some of these stupid um you know sort of boards with a you know a photo opportunity but you know the, this brewery in ohio decided to use the shape of their state as exactly the same concept so yeah but but i think it goes deeper than just somebody using something for the for the fun of it i mean this is symbolism um you know the shape of the state is a very important concept in in the us probably more so than you know the shape of our counties are in the uk because the shapes of their states are used on everything from number plates to um you know the the sort of driving licenses all this sort of state-based stuff and it becomes synonymous you know one of the first questions anybody says to you if you're in the us is, oh what, what where are you from and what they mean is what state do you come from so anytime there's a company with an with a an opportunity to um you know raise the flag for their state they will do and uh, in fact you see this particular um shape of ohio on all of the brew dog glassware that you find in in the brewery as well over there um, and it just so happens to be human sized. So I thought I'd take a picture of Mark. Yeah. And I think also, um, Ken, what we've seen in, th- in you know, well over a thousand of these images now is how geographic shapes, you know, of, of states in the US, of countries are iconic. You know, you don't have to sort of symbolize them, put labeling on them people recognize these shapes very very quickly and they're used in all sorts of different ways because they're so recognizable all right there's a question so i'll just i'll answer it now jim goldsmith's asking about the one on my arm so there it is there you go there's a map in the wild oh what your tube map yeah yeah so by now you'll probably say, where can I find maps in the wild? Well, you could go to our website, which is mapwe.org. You could follow us on Twitter where we're at maps in the wild, or you could sign up for our weekly email at mapwe.org slash mailing list. And in any of those places, you'll get a daily dose of one map in the wild. Um, Sometimes like this one here, it might be a sort of compass representation. And this shows the different, the distances and directions from the port in Jaffa in 
near Tel Aviv in Israel to Jerusalem, to Amman, to all sorts of places around the world. Uh, uh, but go and have a look when you're ready. Um, so where do they come from? How do you submit one? Well, Ken, tell them how to submit. Uh, well, I mean, any which way you like, really. Um, I mean, you know, I guess the, the more formal way of submission, I mean, it, submission sounds a terribly formal process. I mean, there's nothing formal. There's nothing formal about Maps in the Wild whatsoever. It's basically, you know, it, it kind of exists. So any way you get a message to, you know, me or Stephen or Arno, then it's just like you can tweet with the Maps in the Wild hashtag or use the hashtag itself. You can email maps at mapri.org um, or, or just, you know, send in an email or um, a, a direct message. I mean, the one thing, the one thing you'll find out is if you, you know, if you send us something that we find funny, it will find its way onto Mappery somehow. Um, so we kind of assume that if you've sent it, um, there is some sort of tacit permission to to use it, albeit that obviously we'll, we'll, we'll make sure that, you know, you're attributed in the right way, or if you prefer to be anonymous, then that's absolutely fine. Because there are some interesting maps that, that, that we see that probably ought to remain anonymous <laughs> you want to give an example no okay so a few numbers about the project um we just had our fourth birthday so we kept going four years is a long time to keep going we started off at three posts a week moved up to four then to five and Arno and I are now talking about going to seven posts a week um I remember when we had a conversation when, you know, you were saying, I think we should go with three a week. And I, I said, this isn't going to last. This is going to, this is going to burn out after a few weeks. I think you should go with one a week and just, you <laughs> That's know. True. Just... That's true. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so far we've published 1500 images. Um, obviously some posts have more than one image. You'll have worked that one out. You're clever people. We've got about one and a half thousand followers on Twitter. We've got about a thousand on LinkedIn and the email list. Um, and of course, we've got people who just go straight to the website and don't follow us on any of those things. Um, and just in case you hadn't noticed the Lego globe, this was one of Ken's creations. Um, didn't you win a BCS prize for this, Ken? No. No? No, I, I brought it along to BCS when we were in. Um, oh, we were in London, the yeah. one near Earl's Court. I forget exactly which year. It was the London Mapping Festival right. version. Um, no, no, that's um, that's designed by a German guy called Dirk. You can actually download the plans um, for that that particular globe, should you wish. Although Lego, Lego brought out a a globe now. Yeah, I mean it's and rubbish, but. So these are Ken's favourites, so I'll let him describe them. Well, Stephen has a, an aversion tattoo, to tattoos, but um, he's very, very magnanimous and allows them on the site. I, I, I think there's nothing more fascinating than, than those who, you know, they take the step of committing something on... To their body is permanent i mean as permanent as it can I mean, you can cover the things up but they get very difficult if you try to do things like that um and i'm up there getting i think that's my first covid jab and i said make sure you put it in a station <laughs> and um you know some of these are ones i've taken i think the top left was in a no no the one to the right of my tube map was just taken in a bar in japan and that's the barman, and he's passing the change over. I noticed this world map on his forearm. And actually, you might just be able to see that some of the it's a, it's a map of the countries of the world, and some of them are shaded in. And he's using it as one of those kind of scratchy, scratch and sniff kind of things. But instead of it, you know, being a poster, every time he goes to a new country, he goes back to the tattoo artist and gets the country shaded in um, on his arm. Which is, so it's it's a, a piece of a, a, um, 
interactive art on his on his own on his own body. Um, you know, there's some wild and wonderful fantasy kind of things in the bottom bottom right versions. The bottom left is a it's just an advert. It, it may even not be a real tattoo, but it's it's an advert using a tattoo on an arm. And the top right one, well, it's Florida Man, and you can Google Florida Man, and that's that's what they look like apparently. <coughs> <coughs> I mean, I, I don't think I go that far. Maybe Stephen, you should have something like that with the Arsenal crest and sort of a bit of North London, the map, the street map of North London on your forehead. Yeah, maybe Ken. Well, we'll talk about that. All right. So, I like maps on alcohol, and this is actually the inverse of this: that it's alcohol on a map. Um, Ken lives in California. Um, it's a bit different to where most of us live. Uh, he's got a swimming pool. They have sun for what seems like about eight months of the year. And if it gets a bit cool in the evening, he's got a fire pit, which is basically a cast iron sphere cut out in the shape of a globe um, where you can sit and burn gas and uh, <laughs> chill in front of the swimming pool. You know, there's an energy crisis ongoing, don't you? I've not used the fire pit for months and months. You'd be pleased to know. And, of course, you can see just on top of it, um, there's a pint of beer. But it's just an example of um, our obsession with alcohol and maps and how they come together. So well, I, I think that the original idea came about over a beer, if I recall rightly, because when we sat in a... Um, we were sat in a camp somewhere on that safari having a having a glass of beer and the beer itself had a map of africa on that's right on the actual badge and we were just sat there staring at this beer looking at this map of africa and thought hmm, hmm. that's interesting you know there's, there's maps on beer and wine and all sorts this 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 let's collect them um ken what about this map of yours Oh, uh, so my dog likes globes. I mean, honestly, I, I nearly, well, I did. I, I bought one each of these for him because why have just one when there's choice? So he's got a small blue and green globe and he's he's got two big globes, the, the orange and cream one and then the, the larger blue and green one. Um, and I have to report that he, he, he hates them. He doesn't really play with them at all. He just uses a different ball, but... I like them. <laughs> so but this is what I mean. Why, why wouldn't you, if you've got a ball, why not create a globe out of it? Of course you create absolutely. a globe out of it. And so, th those globes, just to finish that story, those globes are in a, um, a sort of a doggy daycare place, which is about 200 yards from uh, Esri headquarters in Redlands. So I have to hand it to the owners of this place who look after dogs and groom dogs of people who work at the map factory and they stock globes. So it's a very shrewd marketing uh, technique for them because they're going to sell a lot of them. Very shrewd. So you might have got the impression that everything that we do with Maps in the Wild is light-hearted, based around <laughs> alcohol, dogs, and funny things. Well, it's not quite all, because we get stuff sent to us which is much more serious. And um, here you can see a mixture of art and historical awareness. Um, the tiles on the left have got the names of mainly Jewish people that were killed in World War II. The names were adopted by the people of Tilburg in the Netherlands who live now and feel the need of keeping those memories alive. And the map indicates where the people lived. Um, the map to the right, this one, I don't know whether you'll see it on my screen, but the one on the right is a map of Cambodia um, made out of skulls. Um, and it's from the Tlong Sleng Museum in Phnom Penh. If there are any Cambodians, I apologise for mangling the language, but it's a pretty gruesome map. And 
this map down the bottom is back in Tilburg and the people there gathered together, they created this very simple outline map of the, the town and the areas within the town. And then they put down these labels or tiles to represent the people who died in those different areas. I mean, so it's a lot more serious and, um, you know, just maybe gives you reason to think. And there are also interesting ways of, um, of sort of demonstrating tragedy with maps um, as well as demonstrating funny things. This is one of Ken's. Well, I, I think just to round that point out, I mean, these, these are, it's basically a site with everybody's holiday slides, but we can't all go everywhere. And so, you know, being able to see a lot of these weird and wonderful creations from all over the world. Um, is, I mean, how would I have known about that Cambodian map of skulls if if it weren't for this site i'd never have come across it no. um you know so so it's kind of kind of interesting um this is one that i just i took in london actually a couple of years ago um people make use of the tube map in all manner of different ways but um you know that sort of use of a very familiar color the blue of the tube map for the river and um you know, the idea of a schematic and just putting the map of London. I mean, the map of the Thames is is so iconic. Um, and and the use of maps on advert for advertising and on, on adverts is, I mean, you can hardly go a, a day without seeing a map used somewhere for advertising purposes. And then when you when you mix it with the tube or the tube map, sometimes um it, it just sort of becomes its its own its own thing. I think this is great. Yeah, it is great. I love the leaf, leaves up there as well. Mm. You know. um, so this is the most popular map that's searched for on the website. Um, Dave Lovell sent us this pic. It claims to be the world's largest map being unveiled in Dubrovnik in 20, 2007. It's a map of... Dubrovnik Neretva County. It's 11 meters wide and six meters high, and it's made up from 40 1 to 25k sheets enlarged to a scale of 1 to 15k. Um, I'm not sure if it's really the largest map in the world. Um, there's an American Latina map that we've also got on the site, which is pretty massive and is about 10 meters high, but this one claims to be. And the interesting thing is that because we titled this post the world's largest map, the search engine optimization has meant that thousands of people search on Google for what is the world's largest map, and they get taken to our website, which is pretty damn cool and brings in a lot of traffic to the website. So. Um, that just shows how inadvertent search engine optimization can work for you. We've got about one minute, Stephen, so we'll have to no wrap No problem. Up. We're nearly done. Yep. Go on. Um, uh, globe on water. I can't remember. Okay, it's not on my so notes. The question was, <laughs> um, who posts um, and where do they post? So the top contributors are... and. The reason I'm telling you who these people are is one of them's Ken, obviously, because he's a map geek and you'd expect that. The second most prolific contributor is a guy called Rinder Storm, who's the curator of special collections at the University of Amsterdam. And the third most prolific contributor is my friend Elizabeth Young, who's a semi-retired doctor that lives near to me and who once she saw the idea of maps in the world, just cannot stop sending me uh, things that she spotted on her travels around London. So, I mean, it, the point is, it's a very varied selection of people. And where do they post? Well, if you assume that most people are posting things that they've seen, this gives you an idea of the density of the posts. And you will find that, of course, a hell of a lot of them come from England, but also from North America, Canada, and Australia. I mean, we are an English speaking site. And if you go to the site, you've got the chance to, um, to browse this map, 
click on the pins and actually explore the whole collection that way rather than by going through it linearly. So Ken. Uh, we can skip past this. Maps on food. That's all. Um, I, I did a little side project during lockdown, which was maps at home. You know, if, if you if you have a one good idea, steal it and do it again. So mm. it's basically maps that people had inside their home because we weren't traveling anywhere. Um, and here's just a, a few there's jigsaws, pictures hanging on a wall. Um, and this this one on the right is from Joe Wood. It's the patterns made by a snail on his skylight, which looked map like. So that made us smile. OK, and. That's it. That's it. Except to say that this is probably the map of 2022, in my opinion. It was spotted by Rinder Storm at the Ukrainian embassy in The Hague, I think probably in April, uh, very early on. And if ever a map is going to say more than a whole load of words, I'd say this is it. So thanks very much for listening to us blather on about maps in the wild. Have a look at mapry.org, follow us on Twitter, send Ken or me an email, any way you like, but send us your maps. Thank you. Thanks very much, guys. Excellent. Um, yeah, I suppose after four years, you start seeing maps everywhere, even where there may be no maps there yeah definitely i'll check out the site and i'm sure other people are really interested as well and thanks to all of our speakers thanks to everyone who came along to listen